Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Shumacast. I am Noel, being joined, as always, by Angie. Welcome, everybody. And we have a very special return guest. Everyone, please welcome back, Lore. Thank you so much. It's really nice to be back. (laughs) I'm so glad that we've had you on this series because you've been one of my favoritest guests. Oh my god, thank you. You're absolutely on my list for any future shows I do. (laughs) Oh, you guys are awesome. I love doing this so much. It's been like an amazing thing for me. It's been a delight. And I say that now because we don't have you scheduled for any other future episodes. (laughs) (laughs) It's just because we don't have any available. I feel bad about the choice of films, but... (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'll watch anything once. So tonight's movie is The Babysitter, which I thought was a different movie, but no, it is not The Crush. Right, right. Me too. That's kind of going into it, expecting The Crush, and then we got this, and I'm like, okay. You're like, two movies that came out like back to back. Well, what's funny is I actually just saw The Crush for the first time Mm. last weekend. Was it good? Uh, Her performance (laughs) is tremendous. Nothing else about the movie. Is it fun? It's a lot of fun. It's really skeevy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I thought her performance was great. And what's funny is I didn't realize she was in this. I kind of went into this cold. So Mm. seeing this, it was just kind of a weird pattern for (laughs) Alicia Silverstone. Yeah. I bet. It's interesting that we had that whole era. I was going to like do a bunch of research on that era because we, you know, we had Poison Ivy and yes. you know, Hand mm-hmm. the Rocks the Cradle and all that. But this movie isn't really that. No, it's not at all. So suffice to say, had, had either of you seen The Babysitter before? No. I hadn't even heard of it. So for our listeners, we are discussing the 1995 film The Babysitter, which is neither written nor directed by Joel Schumacher, but he was an executive producer on it. Yeah. And just to give a little history on that, the reason why he's an executive producer on that is because it was written and directed by Guy Furland, who was Joel Schumacher's personal assistant Oh. on Cousins, Flatliners, Dying Young, 2000 Malibu Road, and was even an associate producer on Falling Down. Mm. So he owed somebody a favor. Seems that way. Yeah. So it was pretty much, yeah. His assistant wanted to make a film, and he called in a favor. And there's people in this cast who have worked with Joel before. Mm -hmm. Alicia would work with him again. It feels like, hey, your boss is calling in some favors to give you your first big break. Right. Which I don't necessarily say is a bad thing. That's how a lot of the industry works. It's all about what you actually do with the opportunities you get. We'll discuss what he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why this choice with that opportunity, but yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And this was his directorial debut, and to date, this is the only screenplay he's ever written. Mm -hmm. He also directed the films Telling Lies in America, Our Guys, Outrage at Glen Ridge, Delivered, After the Storm, Bang Bang You're Dead, and Dirty Dancing, Havana Nights. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) Which to date is his last film. (laughs) All right. Though he has since become like a very prolific director. He's done everything like from Walking Dead to Arrow to S.H.I.E.L.D. He's one of the most prominent regular directors on Sons of Anarchy. Oh, okay. The only other credit on this one is it's based on a short story by Robert Coover, which I didn't realize until I saw the end credits of the movie. And had I known, I would have actually read the short story as research. Yeah. It's apparently a short story that was written in the 60s. It's a very widely collected story, very popular among literary <laughs> circles, because it's one of those stories that, as is probably reflected by the film, it blurs fantasy and reality. Okay, yeah. I'm guessing without the slow push in every time we cut to a fantasy. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's kind of hard to do that in a story. That drove me absolutely crazy. Because <laughs> the story is apparently known for you never quite know if you're in the reality or the fantasy. What's real or not? Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. The film, on the other hand, we'll get to. Yeah. Quick synopsis on it. It's an average evening in a coastal suburb town where a pretty teenage girl has been hired by the Tuckers to babysit while they attend a gossipy party of their middle class yuppie friends. While there, tensions between the Tuckers arise as both start to heavily drink, with Dolly beginning to fantasize about an affair with her host, Bill Holston, and Harry trying to find ways to sneak away as he fantasizes about catching the babysitter in compromising situations. 
Elsewhere, the babysitter's boyfriend, Jack, is frustrated that he and the babysitter haven't gone all the way, and he falls victim to the vicarious prodding of his so-called friend, Mark, who keeps swinging between destructive brags about having slept with the babysitter in the past, spoiler, he hasn't, and urging Jack into making a spectacle of himself so Mark can swoop in and act the hero. As they sneak out of the house, Jack is driven by his fantasies of fucking the babysitter, Mark is driven by fantasies of fucking the babysitter while making Jack watch. Hell, even the little kid is having his first awakening sexual fantasies of the babysitter as he flips through stolen playboys with a flashlight. That was so upsetting. In reality, she just wants to get the kids to bed, clean spilled food off of herself, and relax for the night, but everything culminates in Mark and Jack sneaking in and both talking their way around the babysitter insisting they leave. Jack tries to make his move, is countered by Mark making his move, leading to Jack realizing Mark's motives and a huge fight breaking out that trashes the living room and leads to the little kid calling the cops. Parallel to this, an absolutely smashed Harry Tucker finally gets the car keys away from his wife and drives home to make his move, which coincides with Jack and Mark chasing the babysitter across the street and Harry plowing into Mark with his car. As the dust clears, Harry is led away in handcuffs, Dolly is driven home in humiliation after having thrown herself at an uninterested Bill Holston, and by the way, did I mention that Bill Holston is Mark's father, because he and his (laughs) wife get to see their son loaded into a body bag in the back of an ambulance. Jack tries to apologize to the babysitter, and we only now learn that she has a name, Jennifer. (laughs) Right. As she looks at Jack and says, what were you thinking? She could be speaking to the director. I know. Honestly. (laughs) The end. (laughs) Angie, (sighs) do you recommend the babysitter? I recommend you stay as far away from this movie as possible. (laughs) This is garbage. (laughs) There is no characterization. There is no point to it. There is really bad directorial choices. There's so much. I'm sure we're going to get into it all. It's just no, no, no. Lore, do you recommend The Babysitter? Absolutely not. (laughs) I feel like the movie that they thought they were making was an erotic thriller, but what they were actually making was a completely masochistic piece of crap (laughs) where the main... I'll call her the main character, even though she doesn't do much but deal with these Mm. idiots and rebuff them in turn, is reduced to nothing but a damsel in distress who's being preyed on by... Not even that. She's just being preyed on the whole film. She's a prop for them. There's nothing to it, honestly. There's nothing to it but a reflection board for their fantasies. (sighs) Yeah, it... Guys, this is a weird movie. No, I don't recommend it. It's not a well-made movie. Yeah. I think there's a lot of interesting things at play. I think it's an interesting structural concept. I like the idea of exploring the way that men are driven by their lustful fantasies, but they don't really counter that very well or peel beyond it very well. Yeah, it just develops into nothing. Yeah, there's no point to it. Exactly. I mean, and I know the pointlessness is kind of the point because it's one of those very mundane things where everything just goes to shit. The director had obviously seen Twin Peaks recently. (laughs) And was trying his damnedest. The score is just bizarrely Ugh. all over the place. Yeah. The performances aren't bad, but it's just the way the scenes are put together are so strange and off-putting. And I don't know, the writing is just oh, the right, the, awful. The dialogue is atrocious. Yeah. Especially for the adults, quote unquote, in the film. Oh, God, I felt yeah. like the dinner party it was embarrassed for a lot of the participants. This is one of those films where, to be fair, it did have me gripped in that I had no idea where it was going and I wanted to see where it actually went. Uh, but that wasn't as an appreciation <laughs> of quality. I'm just kind of like, where? Right, no. It was this stuperific, literally, what were you thinking? <laughs> There were moments where I was like, wait, whose fantasy was that supposed to be? I know, right? You know what? I don't care. I don't care. (laughs) You know, when you had mentioned earlier about, I think you used the word vicarious. I actually thought you said at first bicurious, which to me perfectly describes all of the fantasies that Mark is having with Jack in them, because he seems just as obsessed with Jack as he does with the babysitter. (laughs) And I'm not sure if that was intentional or not, but I didn't quite understand what it was that he thought was going to happen. Because surely he didn't really think he was going to get this girl's boyfriend to bring him to the house. And then he would just watch while they had sex. It seemed like they had something else in mind. Yeah. I don't know. 
I don't know if it was some sort of macho, like, I'm going to make this guy watch while I do what he can't, kind of. I don't know. I think it's that kind of power fantasy. Yeah. You know, he's jealous also that his friend has this beautiful girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Because, again, he's idolizing and fixating on her. Right. He doesn't really give a shit about Jack. He just cares that Jack has something that he wants. But why was Jack listening to anything he said? That's what I couldn't figure out. Because... Bad writing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and you know, the film, it attempts to have him try to push Mark away, and Mark is like the devil on his shoulder, always kind of like sneaking in. This is a script which could be made into a very interesting movie. It's just not being executed in a way that actually sells a lot of what it's trying to do. Right. What we're talking about is at the heart of it is that, yeah, that's a really interesting, twisted relationship between these two so-called friends who aren't really friends. But it's just not being executed well. Yeah, in reality, you just tell the guy to go away and you wouldn't keep hanging out with him all night. It makes no sense. God, this feels like a Roman Coppola movie. (laughs) It's one of those ones where it's like, I can see the glimmer of why everyone was interested in being a part of this project. But it's one of those ones that just doesn't come together. (sighs) Man. (laughs) And part of me is like, you know, as I was watching it and I'm seeing that all these sequences are coming out through the fantasies instead of Mm -hmm. actual like murder and all this trashy stuff. I almost wish that it had a mundane ending where like nothing actually ends up happening. Nothing actually happened, yeah. Where it's like, you know, they're sneaking around outside the house and Jack ends up saying fuck this and leaves and Mark is too much of a coward to actually do anything. And like the dad comes home and nothing is quite what he thought it would be. And so he just like falls asleep on the couch or something. And like nothing actually happens. And it's all this buildup about people getting lost in their own thoughts and fantasies. Yeah, that would actually kind of, I mean, it still wouldn't be the most interesting film to watch, but it would work better. We have a lot of thoughts in our heads and fantasies and things like that, but we don't act on them. And these guys, they're just super creeps. Yeah. I couldn't really figure out at the end when Mark gets hit by the car. It's almost like they're saying, oh, it's karma or something, or it's, It's literally karma. It's literally (laughs) karma. He was run over by a karma. I think that was the attempt, but it just didn't come off very well. But it makes me wonder, who is this film for and what's it trying? to say because i don't feel like they're trying to make an object lesson of men and their fantasies i feel more like they just needed a way to end it that was exciting yeah unless that's a much more integral to the short story than it is to the film because it absolutely makes no sense that he would suddenly be hit by the guy and then he's dead and then at the end it's just everyone not sure what happened it just felt like a cop-out and then also just that they made him the son of the couple from the other party just so they could drive the wife home and see their son dead that was pretty right, awful to right. be honest. <laughs> it's like, again, I can see where their attempt at like a storytelling poetry is there. Mm-hmm. It's not selling. Right, right. No, it just felt even more ugliness on top of the ugliness we'd already been witness to. I was mm-hmm. so upset by the father of the kids that were being babysitted. I can't remember his name in the film. Harry. 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 Yeah. He was the most despicable character. I, I could not figure out what was going on with that one fantasy he had where he ended up killing her. What the hell was that all about? Yeah. And that's another strange thing about like, it's like once again, it was like sometimes it's like, wait, is that his fantasy? Doesn't that make more sense if that would be like the wife's fantasy or yeah. something that she would catch him and be like, hi, you're so obsessed with this chick that now you're going to jail? Like it started getting really bizarre toward the end that a lot of the fantasies just didn't really make sense. Well, and that's where I think what they were trying to do, and apparently this is what some of the story does, is they were trying to blur lines to where you started to lose track of who's having what fantasy. Mm -hmm. And I can get that. It came across to me, but I still wasn't like pulled in by it. No, no. Yeah, by the time they got to, like, the little kid having the fantasy, and I honestly <laughs> didn't think they would go there. I laughed so hard when they did I did, that. too. I didn't think they were going to go there. And at first I thought, oh, they're not going to do that. And then when it happened... The moment the camera zoomed in on him. Yes. And then when it happened <laughs> later, I thought, so is it going to be the baby next? <laughs> like, is it going to have, like, a breastfeeding fantasy or something? I mean, that's the kind uh, of movie this is. Yeah. 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 See, I was just distracted by, I'm like, that is totally a grown man's hand with the soap. They didn't use the kid for obvious reasons. (laughs) Like, I was just completely out of the movie at that point. Oh, my God. (laughs) Well, the kid was dreaming of having these larger adult hands. (laughs) (laughs) That's part of it. Every kid wants to be old and every grown up wants to be a kid, you know? I know. Yeah, sure. (laughs) His fantasy is literally just that he has big hands. That's all of it. That was the point where the story was, I was just started laughing at the movie. Mm -hmm. To be fair, it is a funny addition of like, everyone's having this fantasy, including the kid having his first burgeoning fantasies. 
Again, it's like if this was more of a intellectual exploration of this fantasy thing instead of just using mm-hmm. it as a tool, that would be an interesting addition. Right. And even then the kid finds out about all this other stuff because he actually did sneak out of his room hoping to spy on her. Mm-hmm. And it's like all these things happen because the people are hoping to enact their fantasies. Then it all just falls apart. So I guess in that way, it almost kind of makes sense that we never really see her naked because it's like they're not getting what they want. Well, and part of that's also Alicia Silverstone turned down the film four times until they agreed to remove all nudity. Oh, good for her. Well, I don't blame her. I mean, that one scene with Tuesday Night is so pointless. Yeah, it's like you wouldn't know that that's someone who just did six episodes of a TV series with Joel. (laughs) Right. Well, they had to see somebody's breasts. I guess they just went for the actress they could get. I don't know. Mark and Jack shirtless was enough for me. (laughs) I've got a soft spot for Jeremy London, I'll admit it. (laughs) Some of those Mark and Jack scenes where they're kind of looking at each other. I'm thinking, this guy's got a crush on Jack. Like, there's something else going on there. I I could not figure out if it was intentional, if it was just reading into things, if it was just the way it was shot. If Joel had done it, I would say it was intentional. Oh, yeah. Oh, imagine the Joel version of this. (laughs) Especially as the fantasies just start descending into more and more. Like, go full flatliners with it. (laughs) I don't know. I still feel like this movie needed a little bit more of a point. Or go a lot more surreal. One of the two. You either have to make less sense or more sense. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and building on that, before I get to my thoughts, so Laura, do you have any further thoughts about the Alicia Silverstone character as a character? I think she's a great actress. I don't think this material was anything that she could do anything with. Yeah. She really sells it, especially in her expressions. She really gets that confident, bored teenager. She just nails it in a way that I think a lot of other less skilled actresses would have come off as too precocious or too adult. I think that she really nails the age range she's playing. I like watching her on screen. I think she's a great actress. I just don't feel that there was anything for this character. You could empathize with her, but you couldn't really root for her. There was nothing to root for. It was like watching somebody being preyed on for an hour and a half. Yeah, I mean, pretty much the same. Like I said, to me, it's almost more like she's a prop or she's the MacGuffin of the story, if you will. Like, it's not her fault as an actress. What she's been given is just so little. She should have followed her gut and not just about the nudity, but just said, you know what? This film isn't worth my time. (laughs) She doesn't get to do anything. She's just there for them to lust after. And I think that's where the ultimate failing is. It's like, I get the point of the whole exploring the way that all of the men are fixating on their fantasies about her, Mm -hmm. but not enough is done to counterpoint that. Right. To just show that I don't give a shit what you want to do with me. I'm here to babysit. I got to study. I have my other plans. I have my own life. Yeah. There is no real counterpoint that she gets to build off of that stands against that. Play chased and take care of the kids a little bit. That's about it. Yeah. Or after Mark gets hit by a car, hit your mark, look pensive. Right. (laughs) Do a little homework, too. Don't forget that was in there. Hit your mark after he hit his mark. (laughs) You did that on purpose. That was so great. (laughs) Again, it's an interesting idea, but it's not fleshed out enough to really Mm -mm. sell it. No. There's so much of the fantasies that they are objectifying her even as they are exploring the objectification of her. Mm Mm-hmm. Because it doesn't pay off in any way. I mean, yeah, okay, one of them gets hit by a car, the other one's going to jail. But it's like such a pat little quick thing. And there's definitely nothing for Jack. There's no punishment for him. But she probably broke up with him. Probably, oh, yeah. but <laughs> I hope she kind of so. already had, it sounded like. Three days later, he would be showing up at her door begging for forgiveness again. <laughs> I don't see Jack changing. The thing that I found upsetting about the fantasies was if this movie were made by somebody else, it might have taken time to explore a version of the fantasy where the babysitter, Jennifer, was receptive. But in all of the fantasies, when these guys were imagining themselves with her, she was still a little bit bewildered, a little bit out of it. She just lacked agency, even in their fantasies. That really upset me. I mean, I could understand an older man having a fantasy that this girl approaches him, that something happens with her leading the way. But for him to just kind of bust in on her in the bathtub and scare her, and the whole time she's acting uncomfortable, even in his own fantasy of her. There were a few where she was into it more early on a little but she still seemed really out of it you know like the scene where he's driving her home in the car and she's kind of slumped back in the seat and sort of smiling like she's been drugged i kind of got the feeling she was 
supposed to be masturbating and they just weren't oh. showing it. Maybe that was <laughs> wow, me. they did a really bad job. <laughs> Maybe that was just me reading into it. But the way she was like positioned, I kind of got the feeling that that was what we were supposed to be taking from that. And part of that, they're also playing that coy fantasy of, but what will your wife think? You know, that mock right. hesitation. Mm-hmm. And they're also, especially in Tucker's fantasies, giving a kind of childlike quality to her. Right. But yeah, his fantasies get darker and darker as it goes on. And so do Mark's, too. Right. Especially as they become more violent. Yeah. I would like to see someone else approach. I'm wondering if part of the problem is just that it's a film made by dudes. Could be. That's probably a big part of the problem. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Again, I I get the the idea of their men trying to reflect on male objectification of women. But again, they're still not bringing that woman's perspective to the actual character of the woman. You know, it would have been hilarious is if even Dolly had had a fantasy about her or something like that. (laughs) If they just suddenly started yeah. going to all the adult women being in love with her too, just went full hog on it. <laughs> and it was interesting that Dolly was having the fantasies about the affair. Which I couldn't figure out what about that guy was appealing at all. Well, it's George Siegel. Well, okay, he, fine. He was big in the 70s. But if it wasn't George Siegel, I mean... See, all I know of him is that he was the guy who knocked up What's-Her-Face and Look Who's Talking. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god, I forgot about Kirstie that. Alley, that's who I'm trying to think of. Well, yeah. and then also, I don't know if you remember from our very first episode, Angie, he was the star of Bloom and Love, that film that Joel Schumacher worked on about the guy oh, who rapes okay. his ex-wife. He was in that one? Okay. He was the lead. He was Bloom. <laughs> yeah, it, it got weird. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really know how else to describe this movie. It's just, it got weird. <laughs> yeah, I, half the notes that I had written down were just, what the hell, what the hell, what the hell. <laughs> I wanted to have some good thoughts about it. I thought I had some good thoughts about it, but they were mostly just angry thoughts. Even when it was supposed to be erotic, it wasn't erotic. It wasn't. It felt like a violation. It was just creepy most of the time. I mean, I'm sure it's somebody's fantasy, but this is gross. I don't want to meet the person whose fantasy is sharing the dad's fantasies. Yeah. Mm. They're not well executed. They're not... No. Yeah. Every time it would go to zoom in on somebody's face, I'd be like, oh boy, here we go again. Exactly. And that's my biggest thing is that you aren't even having that blurring of the lines if you're literally telegraphing every fantasy with the same trick. Yep. So what do you think about the music? (laughs) Bizarre. (laughs) That loving, whimsical music that we start off with when she's walking. It's like the score to Mrs. Doubtfire. Like, oh, it's a fairy tale. No, it's not. What are you doing? What are you doing? And it came back again later. I don't remember which scene now. Well, I mean, even there's some bits where like this chipper saxophone cuts in appropriately. And... <sighs> yeah, just bizarre. And it's like half the movie. And this is where some of my Twin Peaks comparison comes in. I feel like this is trying to do the Twin Peaks thing of trying to do this uncomfortably absurd normality mm. of like this kind of almost mundanity that's played in a slightly odd angle, but not doing it well. No, not at all. And probably the biggest comparison I have is the way it uses background music sometimes in scenes where it's just this droning, like someone's got a jukebox going or something like that. Remind me a lot of the restaurant scenes in Twin Peaks. Right. And like Mark's fantasies were always read to. Yeah. I'm not comparing this to Twin Peaks. I'm just saying you could tell he saw it. Right. Yeah, no. I, I would agree with that. I'm with you. I hadn't thought of that till you mentioned it, but thinking back on the way that the music, the way that it was filmed, it definitely had that kind of a vibe to it. It's just so poorly executed. It's like a really bad imitation. But again, that it swings between that and literally like early 90s family movie score. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I actually like this as a time capsule of a certain type of suburban life in 95, especially not just the fashion, but you mentioned earlier, and I think this is just indicative of the time that we live in, that this was going for a typical middle class family. And when I watched the film, I thought these people are rich. And looking back on it, no, you're right. This is a 1995 middle class family. Their friends are rich. Their friends are rich. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But she's going out in her pearls and her cocktail dress for an evening with her boring friends who just talk about golf and they're going to drink too much. And it just seems like kind of a weird time capsule of a thing that doesn't really exist anymore. Well, these are the yuppies of the early 80s who are now hitting middle age. Right, exactly. But I feel like that type of adult interaction isn't something that we see a lot in foreign films. The whole idea of the people that only see each other when they meet up to have a drink at somebody's house after a party. It's socializing. It's a different kind of socializing. Mm. I think it's a socializing that's kind of, I just don't remember the last time I saw it on screen. And oh my God, that pregnant woman's dress. Remember how bad (laughs) maternity dresses used to be? 
with all the bows uh, up the front. Oh, see, I just have to complain about what Alicia Silverstone is wearing because I remember that whole look of like you wore the t shirt and then you had the dress with the little skinny yep. straps and the boots, mm-hmm. but you wore a solid colored shirt, you did not wear stripes. No, I actually had that thought. I had that thought when I watched it with the floral. No one did that. I remember that clearly <laughs> because when I was in middle school in 1995, that was mm-hmm. a big look. You would wear the solid right. white baby tee. You yep. would wear the strappy shirt over it because no one would wear a strappy shirt by itself. That was against dress code. Yeah. When I saw her walk up in that outfit, I thought, what a weird choice. But you know what? I feel like they were trying to make her the edgy version of that. I guess, but it was just so ugly. And then she also had the other wild floral pattern on her purse. And it was like, what are you doing? Well, that's just the 90s. My biggest fashion thing is why did she still have her boots on while she was in the bathroom giving a kid a bath? I didn't even notice that. You guys I didn't could. notice that part, but I mean, sure, why not? <laughs> and why is he wearing flannel under his letter jacket? I'm pretty sure that's another big no-no. <laughs> oh, that was funny. Well, Joel Schumacher only be executive produced. He did not do the costume right. work for this one. Obviously not. He would have given it some flair. Yes. This is... Uh, no. If he's going to contrast something like that, he would do it in an interesting and impeccable way. Well, someone was like, <laughs> this is how the kids dress today, right? Right. And they just did their best estimate. I actually thought Alicia Silverstone looked cute in that outfit. It was a weird clash. I thought it was very her. Mm. But yeah, I too had that ping with the, wait a second, that's supposed to be a white shirt. I remember that right, clearly. Right. But it was the definitive just heading into the mid of the 90s look. You know what it was? It was yeah. for its decade. It was their version of, you remember when the short jean skirt with the crop leggings with lace on the end? <laughs> remember when mm-hmm. that was like the thing for a couple of yep. years? Like back in the late 90s, early 2000s? That was their version of it. Mm-hmm. Sorry to have killed this conversation with fashion talk. I got nothing to say because I was just wearing t-shirts and sweatpants at the time. No, it's just funny because the fashions were like very on point for the time, but slightly off, which is like, were you doing that on purpose because you were trying to build up the surrealism or what? (laughs) The adults were all still stuck in the 80s. This film feels like it's made by someone who can see the edge of a concept, but can't get the whole of it. (laughs) Right, right, exactly. All the way down to the fashions and everything. I'm going to be very curious to see how he does 50s fashion and dirty dancing Havana nights. <gasps> Do you know what really bothered me? When they went to the arcade or the pizza parlor, wherever they were playing it pinball. It was a record store. It was a record store pinball. they were playing pinball. This is 1995. Knowing the early 90s, it was all of those things. It was the record Maybe. pinball arcade. But, but wait a second. Stand. Wait a second. That's how you know somebody wrote this from an 80s perspective. Because no one would have had teens in 1995 going to a record store to play <laughs> pinball. They would have been playing Nintendo. <laughs> Oh, that is a sentence that sums up this movie as a whole. (laughs) (laughs) Or at least like a full arcade cabinet. Like they'd be playing some Street Fighter. Yeah. Exactly. It was like the guy was like, what are the kids into? Weren't they playing pinball a few years ago? It's almost like they drove up to a place to play Pong. You know those 90s kids, they love that Gallagher. (laughs) Remember, they went to the diner too. So it's almost like you're going back to 50s. Yeah, they really didn't seem to have any grasp on what teen... They were supposed to be teenagers, right? Yes. Okay, I was a little bit confused about that. I don't know why this whole conversation is making me think of Ernest Klein too much. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, my brain is going down weird. Yeah. (laughs) It just seemed like somebody wrote this like, hey, I know what kids today do. Mm -hmm. And then proceeded to cast. No complaint on Alicia Silverstone, because I think when she was in a couple years ago, I would say it was 93, I think, was when The Crush came out. And she was playing 14, but I believe she was 17 or 18. And in this Mm -hmm. film, she must be 19 or 20, but she's playing Mm -hmm. a teenager. And the boys looked even older. So it had that kind of weird skewed thing from the 90s where everybody is supposed to be a teenager, but they're in their 30s or whatever. That really threw me. Yeah. I'm just trying to see, where was this in relation to Clueless? I'm pretty sure this is before, because Clueless was 96, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Then she was in Hideaway. Oh, remember that Dean Koontz movie? I know. And then Clueless was was the same year, 1995. Oh, was it? Okay. Okay. Let me see what the date on that was, because this came out in October of 95, so that had to be like right after. Oh my god. That's well, awkward. didn't this just go straight to video or something? Oh, wait. Clueless came out first. That came out in July of 95, and then this came out. Huh. So she would have made this before Clueless blew up into whatever it was. Mm-hmm. So this wasn't just a DVD release or VHS or whatever it was? It never got a wide theatrical release. Okay. It did the indie circle and then went straight to video. Gotcha. Oh, that makes me relieved for some reason, honestly. <laughs> because I'm not going to have to do box office data at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
Do you think the people making this thought that this was high art? I think they thought it was a really interesting concept. Mm. And I'll agree, it is a really interesting concept. I really mm. want to read the original short story. I'd like to see some other people take a stab at this idea. I don't know. Like I said, maybe the story, if it really does blur the lines better, then it might be more interesting. Oh, I'm not saying this specific story, but the idea of it, the way the yeah, fantasies just, are. And all, yeah. To me, it just seemed like an hour and a half of watching people creep on a young girl. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't like that. It wasn't interesting enough to me to want to explore it in any other way. And it wasn't enough about exploring the meanings behind that. Right, right. Oh, hey, the score was by the same guy who did the score for Slow Burn. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. Joel just called in all his friends for this. You weren't here for Slow Burn lore, but suffice it Mm -hmm. to say, Joel Schumacher is 0 for 2 on films that he produced. (laughs) And we've only got one more to go. Yeah. Was it a real Slow Burn? (laughs) No. I have to say, I did enjoy starting up a movie and having literally no idea what it was going to be about, because I'd never heard of it. I didn't even know Alicia Silverstone was in it. Well, and that that was the interesting thing is, again, thinking that this was going to be one of those evil teen girl fatal attraction type things, it did catch me off guard. And again, I was pulled in. I was intrigued to see where they were going with this. Mm -hmm. Was it worth it? Not really. Will I ever watch this film again? Hell no. Hell no. (laughs) So it's a good thing I own it on DVD now. Oh, yeah. (laughs) You can use it as a coaster. I, yes. You know what? I would watch a version of this made now if they switched the genders. But women aren't this creepy most of the time. Ooh, ooh, ooh. What if it's a whole story about women fetishizing on gay men? Hey, that would be Mm. something. But how do you pay it off? Well, if it's good enough, you don't really have to, right? I mean... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you can kind of just let everyone drift off into the night with their weird little fantasy. Easy. An orgy. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> so that it's a porno? <laughs> no, it's just all the women having an orgy while one man looks on in mild disgust. Again, I think that whole exploration of how people sexualize and fantasize about other people and not take the time to actually reflect on who that other person is could be a really interesting setup for not even a thriller, yeah. just as a social study, you know, as a either comedy or a drama. Or But the next step has to be then they are confronted with that. Right. I agree. If they had been some kind of confrontation or some kind of... Here's the thing. I don't need the movie to tell me that being a creep is wrong. I don't yeah. need that because I know that. But what I do need is some kind of acknowledgement that this isn't just an empty exercise of a guy behind the camera thinking, hey, yeah. mm-hmm. check this out. I need something more to it than that. I don't need a moral. I don't need anyone to be hit by a car. I just need something that makes me think the person writing this had a brain. And I'm sure the short story was better. And it's one of those things where, again, the study should be, why are you allowing yourself to be driven by your fantasies? Mm. You have to be able to recognize them for what they are. I mean, I'm a dude. I have a trashy, dirty mind at times. (laughs) Well, we did have my shock jock era. Well, but you also grew up and yeah. <laughs> you now you know now. So. Yeah, now I just don't talk about it. <laughs> what I don't get is, especially, and again, I got to go back to Harry because this guy creeped me out so much. I know that type yeah. and I grew up and I met that type as a young girl and the actor, I mean, he nailed it. Oh, yeah. But what I don't understand is at a certain point, you're just watching this guy make an asshole of himself and creep out everybody. Why doesn't his wife just Mm -hmm. smack the heck out of him or leave him or... I mean, at the end, she kind of did just let him drive off and get into a car accident, but she was also drunk. Right. It seems like the wife understands exactly what kind of man he is. That's what I didn't get. Like, she's (sighs) fantasizing about an affair. She's got the two kids. She's got a creepy ass husband who I would leave in a heartbeat. Yeah. I just don't understand Mm -hmm. why we have to be treated to this character being such an asshole for such a long period of time for the only payoff to be that he hits some other creep with a car. Yeah. He just got steadily worse and worse. And although Mm -hmm. I empathize, I shouldn't say empathize, although I recognize that character very deeply... And I understand that the guy who kind of flirts with the younger girl, he's trying to be cute, but she knows what he's up to and she's creeped out by it. How does that person exist? That would be a great exploration. But instead, it's just here, have this guy for an hour and 30 minutes Mm -hmm. and nothing else. Nothing will ever come of it. Everyone will just be creeped out. Yeah. I hate to bring it up because the actor involved now sickens me, but American Beauty did a much better exploration of this. Mm. It did. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they did it with someone who was a piece of shit in real life and we didn't know it at the time. That is unfortunate. But the movie, you're right. Yeah, but the movie handles it a lot better. We'll be getting there again when we cover House of Cards. Right, I know. 
I mean, I can't watch that movie anymore. Yeah. But it is a better exploration that, you know, it's somebody who is obsessed with this young girl and then slowly comes to realize, oh, wait, this is a child. I shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. I mean, it's handled a lot better. The fantasies are more absurd. Yeah. It's more an exploration of the character in a way that you kind of understand. This was just... This is just leering. It's just... It's just a man leering at it. That's exactly what it is. And it doesn't do anything to drive the story. It just makes him creepy. So if they were going for anything erotic, I can't imagine how. Yeah. And that's the thing is, it doesn't come off as erotic. Mm -mm. A lot of it feels like it's intentionally trying to be absurdist humor, but it's not really working that well. Whenever Mm -hmm. it's trying to be thrilling or scary, it's not really... It's a film that's trying a lot of things, and it's not pulling a lot of it off. Right. I gotta say, I did have a lot of anxiety for her character, especially in the last half. Oh, yeah, because I'm like, what's actually going to happen when everyone gets to that house? (laughs) The part where the fantasy, I can't remember if it was Mark's fantasy or if it was Jack's fantasy, where they knock her on the head with the TV, (laughs) and she's lying there, and he says, oh, you tilted her, like the pinball machine. Yeah, I think that's supposed to be Mark's. That made me laugh, and I felt so sick to my stomach. Yeah. afterwards yeah because it was like such an absurd reaction and it was such a i'm a disgusting pervert who just looks at a woman as an object to play with yeah god that was something yeah that's why i'm pretty sure it's supposed to be mark's is because it's so dark mark as a whole is he's one of those characters who it's like they're trying really hard to bring in this devil quality to him but while i don't think the actor is terrible i don't think he really has that really juicy charisma to really make no. a character like that work Mm-mm. i mean angie is in all seriousness, I kept thinking about how much better this would have been had Jack played. <laughs> God. I mean, I'm just thinking about the character that Jack played and targeted, you know? Sure, sure. You know, the really <laughs> charismatic evil guy. <laughs> yeah, for personal reasons, I'd rather not imagine my husband doing that. No, I know. No, yeah, I agree no, I that he probably has better acting skills. Than and, and to be fair, I love the London twins, but neither one of them are particularly charismatic <laughs> No, not even. Not really. They're very good looking, but yeah. And I always have to look up to see if it's Jeremy or Jason. Uh-huh. It's usually always Jeremy. <laughs> this would have been right after Mall Rats. Oh, wow. Okay. Was it Jeremy in that one? I believe it was Jeremy. Jeremy was the one okay. who most had the prolific career. Most of the acting. Jason was the one in whichever films Jeremy turned out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hate to say it. Oh, October 20th was the release of Mallrats. It came out the week after this. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, not great for his career at that no, point. No, <laughs> no. Oh, no, this was October 17th. So, three days, three days after the release of the babysitter, <laughs> Mallrats came out. Wow. Oh, man. God, I remember seeing the trailer for Mallrats. But I bet you don't remember seeing the trailer for this. Hell no. <laughs> No, I actually saw the trailer for Mall Rats attached to Empire Records in 95. <laughs> I don't know why I have that memory. I've still never seen Empire Records, and I think this is going to be like our fourth episode where that movie's going up. What on <laughs> earth? No, what are you doing with your life? If you haven't seen Empire Records. Working 14-hour shifts. <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> Oh, God, this movie. Yeah. I always give someone credit for trying something. They at least tried something. Yeah. I honestly, I had so much in my head last night before I fell asleep (laughs) watching the damn film. I woke up and I was like, oh, that was just me bitching about the same creepy guy over and over again. That doesn't make for good podcasting. I was so creeped out by that guy. Here's my thing. How many times did he say he was going to leave the party before he actually left the party? Because like, I thought he had left when we would keep cutting back and it's like, oh, he's still there? Yeah. Why was he so mean to his wife? I think that's a very loveless marriage. Ugh. Right. Which kind of is amazing that they had a baby so recently. They had sex at least a year ago. Mm. For the third time. For the third right. time. At least, yeah. <laughs> well, and I'm, I'm assuming it's one of those ones where it probably started off decent. He was probably a power broker yuppie in the 80s. And now, you know, that's all fallen behind. He still has a rich boss and rich social connections. And that's probably what mm-hmm. is keeping her tied to him is that that's where all the money comes from. But even then, yeah. they don't really have much money left because they just have a small house. Maybe the baby was an attempt to try to make it work, like they'd have something to bond over. But yeah. then they find out that they really still hate each other. So even the baby can't can't change that. Even if he didn't run over a kid and get dragged off in handcuffs, they were probably not going to last another year. Right. Okay, but more importantly, imagine living in a time when you had to go to a party at your boss's house and wear a suit. 
That sucks. I know, right? Aren't you glad we live in the future? Screw that. The only way I would do that is if like me and my friends were like, let's have a fancy dress party and we wanted to do it just because. Yeah, nobody does that for real. That's such a time capsule. Yeah, we're having the company party in two weeks. We're going to a bowling alley. Yeah, these days nobody really gets formal for most things. So anyway, anything else interesting to say about this terrible movie? <laughs> um, I'm going to slack on Jeremy London again. Go for it. That was the worst attempted vomit I have ever <laughs> seen in a film. Oh my God, I'd forgotten about that. I'm like, y'all couldn't even afford like a little bit of prop vomit for him to spit out at least. Like he just like literally dry coughed off the <laughs> side and that was supposed to be him throwing up. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Like, what are you doing? This is bad. Yep. Uh, Remember when the kid had his fantasy about spying on her through the keyhole and he got super excited by seeing the back of her knee? Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that was something. Did he live in Puritan times or something? I was like, really ooh. upset by the kids wrestling her because it was so obvious that that older kid was trying to choke her. Well, yeah. It, it was badly acted. <laughs> and it's one of those things where then when you realize the kid's getting a boner about her, that puts mm-hmm. that whole scene in even more context. It's like, oh, right. no, it's not Like he's trying pleasant. to touch her. Yeah, no. That's Oof. not pleasant. Let's not think about that. Yeah, in a more capable director's and screenwriter's hands, this might have been something, but... Oh, I just felt so dirty after watching it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's all I got, though. Our silence says about it, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm sorry, guys. I wanted to have so much to say, but dang, what a movie. I think we've said a lot for what this movie is. It's, yeah, don't watch it. Trust us. I am just looking briefly at Box Office Road just because I at least just want to see what was still out that week. I'm just curious Mm. because this never even got a wide release other than, let me look up Mallrats. That'll give me the date. God, Mallrats. Like, even if you, like, are attracted to Alicia Silverstone and want to see some skin, there's better places to see some of her skin. Yeah, her PETA ads. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, she was never in those type of movies anyways. Mm. That was early 90s Drew Barrymore. Oh, yeah. Right, sure. Were they in a movie together? Were they? Oh, I'm thinking of Liv Tyler and Alicia Silverstone, I think. Well, oh, Liv the, Tyler and Alicia Silverstone did videos. the music video, Janie's Got a Gun. Oh, yeah. No, not Janie's got a gun. Oh, what was then? What was the one? It was like a trilogy of like crying, amazing, and crazy. That's right, crazy. It was like her and Jeremy, I think both Londons, and Liv Tyler. Well, and then of course, (laughs) Drew Barrymore will be in Batman Forever, and Alicia Silverstone will be in Batman and Robin. That's true. The plot thickens. Yeah, they're both connected to Joel now, but. (laughs) So, God, yeah, I'm just looking at what was out in theaters that week Seven Assassins, Dead Presidents, How to Make an American Quilt. Here's your erotic thriller, Jade. (laughs) Strange Days to Die For. Ooh, Paul Rudd, her co-star in Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. Oh, I (laughs) forgot he was in that. And like Apollo 13 was still on the top 10 in its like 16th week. Wow. Pocahontas, Showgirls, The Usual Suspects, Braveheart. It's like, God, a lot of movies were out then. Yeah, lots of movies you could spend your time on instead of this. 95 was a crazy year. I could see why this film never got a release. And then, of course, the week after, when Mallrats opened at number 13, <laughs> Get Shorty opened at number one. Mm, okay. That's as far as I'm going to go with the box office. But yeah, this is an interesting curiosity of a movie. I'm kind of glad I saw it just because I'm intrigued by what it was trying to do. But again, it makes me want to read the short story. Yeah, I think what this tells me is that if Joel's a good friend of yours, he's willing to help you out and he's not even necessarily going to look at the content. He's just going to be like, here you go, buddy. <laughs> Just yeah. do what you will with this. <laughs> well, and that's not necessarily a bad thing on its own because, you know, he let the guy succeed or fail kind of on his own. The guy had a project he wanted to do. Joel was like, I'll give you some support. I'll give you some backing. And it probably happened because it was a nice low budget thing. It could be made with a lot of industry friends. Mm-hmm. But yeah, just the final results just aren't good. All you needed was a zoom lens and a red light. <laughs> And even then, you barely ever see the red light, which is surprising because the cinematographer on this Dallas did House on Haunted Hill. I just know that because I'm a fan of Rick Boda. He got to use it later. (laughs) So I think that's going to wrap up our episode. Any final thoughts, Angie? Stay away. Yeah. Lore. Ditto. Yeah. Don't watch The Babysitter. I'm curious to see The Crush now, because I've never actually seen The Crush. I think you'll like that a bit more. Yeah. It's skeevy in its own way, but it's got a lot going on. I've never seen any of the, like, Poison Ivies or any of those type of movies. I've never seen Hand That Rocks the Cradle. I hear decent things about that one. I think I saw Hand That Rocks the Cradle, I think. 
I don't know. It was a long time ago. Have you seen Fatal Attraction? I've never seen Fatal Attraction. Oh my god. What about Single White Female? I've never seen Single White Female. No, you haven't seen anything. No, I know, right? <laughs> but you've seen this movie. No, I've seen this movie and I've seen half the films of Sayajit Ray and the entire filmography of Akira Kurosawa. So it's like, I'm catching up. The irony. I know, right? He's just got to pick the right director, writer, whoever <laughs> to follow and yeah. then he'll watch it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, again, I hadn't seen most of Joel's, but I hadn't seen Lost Boys before this. Right. <laughs> oh, well, that's a blessing. Hey, I'm still glad I got to see Cousins. I loved Cousins. I still can't believe you loved Cousins. I loved Cousins. So bizarre. I rewatched Cousins like two weeks ago. I still love it. Oh my God. All right. I'm never going to watch Cousin Cousine again, but I like Cousins. It's just you and Ted Danson watching that film over and over again. <laughs> He's probably got his wife Mary roped into it too, but that's about it. <laughs> So thank you again for joining us, Laura. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I wish we could get you for a better one on this one. <laughs> I will be happy to watch anything. I'll watch it. I'll watch it the last minute. I'll come with notes. They'll just be what the hell over and over again, but there'll be notes. <laughs> so anyways, that's going to wrap up this episode. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. <laughs>